Hey, good afternoon. I would uh, like to welcome you to this panel discussion of Professor Samuel Friedman's new award-winning and engrossing book, Into the Bright Sunshine, Young Hubert Humphrey and the Fight for Civil Rights. My name is Jonathan Kaplan, and I'm the director of the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Texas at Austin. A former columnist for the New York Times and a professor at Columbia University School of Journalism, Professor Friedman is the author of 10 acclaimed books, including the one being discussed this evening, as well as uh, uh, one, of, one of his most famous books, Jew vs. Jew, which won the National Jewish Book Award for Nonfiction in 2001. One other notable fact about Professor Friedman is that his class in book writing at Columbia's J School has developed more than 110 authors, editors, and agents, and is still a coveted class, uh, I think, to this day for, for um, J School master's students when they arrive there. Tomorrow evening, Professor Friedman will be giving the fall 2024 Gale Family Foundation lecture, Fighting Hatred in the Heartland, Hubert Humphrey's Battles Against Anti-Semitism and Extremism in Mid-Century Middle America. I want to invite you to join us tomorrow evening in the Texas Union Quadrangle Room 3.304 at 7 p.m. for the lecture with a pre-lecture reception at 6 p.m. in the same room. More information about the lecture and a registration link is available on the Schusterman Center's website. Professor Friedman is joined this evening by an esteemed panel of discussants. Professor Peniel Josephs is Professor of Public Affairs in the LBJ School and the Department of History, the incumbent of the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values, and founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Professor Mark Lawrence is Chair and Professor in the Department of History. Are you still the director of the LBJ Library? <laughs> the for yeah. former director of the LBJ Library and holds the Walter Prescott Webb Chair in History and Ideas. Professor Jeremy Surrey holds, uh, is the incumbent of the Mark Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership and Global Affairs and is a professor of public affairs in the LBJ School and the Department of History. I would like to thank Emily Petrovsky of the Schusterman Center and Courtney Medor of the uh, Institute for Historical Studies for their help in organizing this afternoon's event and for Professor Mark Ravina for opening, opening this wonderful space to us for this gathering. The plan for this afternoon is for Professor Friedman to introduce his book for about 15 minutes followed by responses by the members of our panel. And following their discussion, we will open it up to the audience for questions. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Friedman. Well, thank you, Dr. Kaplan, and thank you, panelists. I'm awed to be in this kind of company, I have to say. Someone asked me earlier today, and it's a question I've gotten many times, not unexpectedly, as I've talked about the book, what led me to want to write about Hubert Humphrey? And the honest answer is I didn't set out to write a book about Hubert Humphrey. I had been walking around for the last 25 years or so with some part deep in the recesses of my brain wanting to write a book about immediate post-World War II America because I wanted to deal with the question of how this country, having spent so much blood and treasure to defeat global fascism and looking at its own deep moral imperfections, decided to reckon or not reckon with them. And the problem is that I could never find an adequate way to encounter, to address that material. And I owe the idea of the Humphrey book to someone who's a good friend of mine and to many of you, Julian Zelizer, a terrific historian from Princeton, who had written a book that came out in 2015 called The Fierce Urgency of Now about the relationship between LBJ and Congress in pushing through the Great Society Social Compact legislation. And my wife and I went to Julian's book launch, and my wife, who had lived in Minneapolis for about 25 years during her first marriage, being a good member of the Minnesota diaspora, asked Julian, what about Hubert Humphrey? And in the course of answering, Julian mentioned Humphrey's legendary civil rights speech at the 1948 Democratic Convention and what an overlooked landmark in civil rights history it was. And I already knew about the speech and I knew it was important, but I have to admit that something about Julian saying it really affected me. In fact, my wife will tell you that she felt me go rigid in, in my seat. And once I checked with Julian and made sure this wasn't a project he was working on, I moved ahead with it. And I had a couple of really important goals for the book and um, conceptions of it from the start that I think served me very well over the eight and a half years I spent on it. First of all, I thought that it was a book that could address a historical gap 
and a biographical gap. The biographical gap, to take that first, is that if people these days know anything about Hubert Humphrey, it's the latter disc dis discredited, disparaged, reviled, ridiculed part of his public life, supporting the Vietnam War as Lyndon Johnson's vice president, getting the Democratic nomination for president without competing in any primaries, and having it handed to him by the Democratic machine exactly at the moment when cameras are cutting away to show Mayor Daley's police beating down un unarmed, nonviolent, anti-war protesters and journalists, and then almost in an unintended self-parody being the establishment war horse candidate for the 72 Democratic nomination against the peace candidate George McGovern. It was during that race when Hunter S. Thompson famously or infamously, depending on how you feel about it, described Humphrey campaigning, quote, like a rat in heat. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt there was this whole earlier part of Humphrey's life that was valiant on civil rights and that was so largely unexplored and it was almost as if the people who felt that Humphrey had betrayed them and betrayed liberalism forgot what it was that he'd ever done that was so good that would make them feel betrayed. And that took me back to this early part of his life as mayor of Minneapolis and at the 1948 Democratic Convention. And that goes to the um, gap I was hoping to fill historically, which is that many accounts of the civil rights movement and a lot of our collective memory as a nation about the freedom movement starts from the assumption that the movement begins in the mid-1950s that it begins with the Brown versus Board of Ed decision in 54, the Montgomery bus boycott in 55, and then we move forward through the Freedom Rides and the lunch counter sit-ins and the March on Washington and so forth. And just like saying, talking about Humphrey's terrible political decisions later in his political career, looking at the civil rights movement of the 50s moving forward is not factually incorrect, it's just incomplete. And I felt that there was this decade of fervent, essential civil rights activism in the 1940s that was led by people like A. Philip Randolph and Walter White, who were themselves way underknown these days, and that was really morally catalyzed by black GIs and by the double V movement, victory over fascism abroad to be leveraged to achieve victory over Jim Crow at home. And Humphreys, early public life and that movement converge very much at the Democratic Convention in 48, but it was also an important part of the backdrop of his work as mayor. So I knew that those were the gaps I was aiming to fill, and I'm, I'm very happy to work in terra, if not totally incognita, terra relatively, demi-incognita. <laughs> and then a couple of the other key decisions I felt like I made early on were these. I would not write, number one, I would not write a cradle to grave biography. I think there's certainly people like, like Ron Chernow who can do it, and in the power broker, Robert Caro did it, but I have often felt as a reader that a lot of those books end up being too long. There's almost an arms race to show all of your homework in them, and it makes it hard for them to work for for readers and hard to work thematically because you're trying to cover so much in any life that eventful. So I definitely did not want to do a, uh, a Cradle to Grave Hubert Humphrey book. The second thing is I said I'm not going to do a great man or for that matter great woman in history book that I knew that Humphrey was going to be at the apex of the, of the pyramid of this book, but this was not going to be about there would not have been the civil rights movement without Hubert Humphrey and everything that he did was irreplaceable and so forth, that I was going to, throughout the book, look for the people to constellate around him, his allies, his influences, his adversaries, and to situate him that way. And the third goal I set for myself, which was related to the second, is no white savior book, and I would also say, because this book deals a lot with this fight against anti-Semitism, no Christian savior book that this was not going to be a book about how the white guy saved the black folks, and this was not going to be a book about how the right, righteous Gentiles saved the Jews. But it was going to be a book about very much the interplay of Humphrey with black Americans and Jewish Americans, how he was affected by them, how he followed in the furrows that they had already laid 
down in the earth of moving towards a, a greater semblance of equality in this country. And I was definitely, from a literary standpoint, looking for who the key characters from the black and Jewish communities, particularly in Minneapolis, were. And so those guided me from the very outset of the book. And I think they, they served me well because they made me look in places that some of the other historians and biographers have not particularly look, looked in. I mean, first of all, Humphrey's early political life gets relatively little attention, although Robert Caro writes brilliantly about it in one of the volumes of his Johnson biography. But even people who give him his props on civil rights are looking more about what he did with the Civil Rights Act of 64 when he was in the Senate or as Johnson's vice president with the Voting Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act, or a less admirable side of Humphrey, what he did on his audition, so to speak, for Lyndon Johnson to go until the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, you're only getting two seats uh, at, at the 64 convention. So not only was his earlier life dealt with you know, very sketchily, if at all, but there were people around him who became essential to my book and who were essential to Humphrey's life. One of them, the person who my editor said is the conscience of the book, which I agree with, was a black newspaper editor in Minneapolis named Cecil Newman, an amazing man, a Pullman porter, <coughs> who was working part-time as a journalist from really his teens on and took his money from working the trains and put it into founding one and then the second newspaper in Minneapolis. The second of them, the spokesman, is operating up to this day. His granddaughter, Tracy Williams Dillard, is still the publisher and the editor of it. And so Cecil Newman, in a few of the books, Timothy Thurber's excellent book about Humphrey um, and equality, and the title's Escaping Me Now, he's the one person who's written on Humphrey I felt really gave Cecil Newman the deserved credit. But overall, Newman is not in it that much. And then there was a Jewish kind of equivalent person to Cecil Newman, who was Cecil Newman's friend and political ally as well, a guy named Sam Shiner, who was a lawyer who couldn't get hired by law firms in, the twin, in Minneapolis because he was Jewish and ended up, after trying to support himself as a jazz pianist, getting hired by the Jewish community because they're so alarmed by the warm reception Minneapolis had given to uh, the Silver Shirts, the, the explicitly pro-Nazi party uh, that Pelley had begun. And Shiner appears virtually nowhere in anything that's been written. One or two historical journal articles, but very little else. Um, just to try to wrap up quickly, Humphrey's wife, Muriel, also is hugely important to him. To the degree anyone wrote about her over the years, it was as a typical political wife on his arm which is completely wrong. And I have to give great credit here to Julia Swag, the historian who did the biography of Lady Bird and the extraordinary podcast about Lady Bird Johnson hiding in plain sight. When I listened to that podcast, I was probably at that point five or six years into my work and I said, all right, I've got to pay a lot more attention to Muriel. I don't want to be the person who didn't, metaphorically speaking, listen to the Lady Bird tapes or read the, read the Lady Bird diaries, because I assumed she was just planting wildflowers on you know, highway exits. And so that encouraged me to really find out more about Muriel and their complicated relationship, which in some ways was very conventional. She did all the emotional labor. She did all the child rearing while he was off being mayor. But was an important political advisor to him, someone he took totally seriously in a companionate way. Humphrey's sister, Frances, who was younger chronologically but older in terms of influence and put herself through GWU during the Depression, was discovered as a young social worker by Eleanor Roosevelt and was into civil rights before Hubert Humphrey himself was and remained an important voice in her letters talking about <coughs> the urgency of these issues. And finally, a professor Humphrey had at Louisiana State, Rudolf Eberly, who was a, an exiled anti-Nazi, one-eighth Jewish professor who was horrified by the rise of the Nazis and made his scholarly project studying as a sociologist how democracies could become <coughs> dictatorships in short order. And a one-year-long seminar Humphrey had with him at LSU was transformative for Humphrey, as was the experience of being in a Jim Crow society for a year. And in terms of political formation and character formation for Humphrey, it was 
not assuming, I don't think historians do this, but a lot of journalists do this, and that's my tribe, that somehow he always had these great values, and that's why at his best he did the things he did. Whereas my question was, and my good friend and fellow professor at Columbia, Michael Shapiro, always says a book has to answer a question. My question was, why does this very vanilla guy from this very vanilla place care so deeply about blacks and Jews? And that meant tracing his character formation through a range of influences, his father's liberalism, which made him quite a dissident in their parochial, very conservative town in South Dakota, Humphrey's exposure to the social gospel strain of Protestantism, which gave him a theological language which would serve him well, the economic collapse in the Dakotas in the 1920s, almost a decade before the Great Depression, when crop prices fell, and Humphrey at that point realized you needed activist government, that failure wasn't just about bad personal choices or being a spendthrift, and all that makes Humphrey a new dealer before there's even a new deal. And then his time at LSU, his exposure to Eberly, and then coming to Minneapolis after the one-year terminal master's degree at LSU to begin his public life and encountering Cecil Newman and Sam Shiner, who give him knowledge, wisdom about Minneapolis and its horrific uh, track record of anti-Semitism and racism. Forget everything you ever thought about the blue city of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And Humphrey gives Shiner and Newman something they've never had, which is access to political power. That the occasional Caucasian Gentile who would really commit to the battle against racism or anti-Semitism in Minneapolis was almost by definition an outsider who had no power because of holding those unpopular beliefs. And suddenly here's Humphrey, who has ambition and talent and this really, really deep commitment. So that was what set me on the, on the path to this book. And in structuring the book, I tried to oblige my goal of not centering Humphrey throughout, developing other people who were importantly influential on him, even those like A. Philip Randolph, who, who at that point Humphrey didn't know particularly well. They became very close personally later on, but who they had this integral forgive me for using this word, synergy, heading into 1948 of A. Philip Randolph as Mr. Outside, literally outside the convention hall, and asking for black draft resistance unless Harry Truman desegregated the military, and Humphrey, Mr. Inside, trying to actually get the civil rights plank passed. So with that, I'm going to uh, muzzle myself and, and turn it over to, to the respondents and discussants. Oh, sure. So you want to go this way? Sure. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Sam, for, for being here and giving us this, uh, this really fantastic book, which uh, I've been thinking about for many months. Uh, Sam was a guest on a podcast I was doing about a year ago with my collaborator, Mark Updegrove, over at the LBJ Library, and I thought it was a really wonderful conversation that I went actually back to and listened to this morning while I was out walking my dog and uh, was, was reminded of a lot of great things um, about, this, about this book. Um, I just wanted to pick up on one thing you were just talking about, your, your development in this book of these other characters, right? Humphrey's at the center of it, but it's really so masterful in teasing out those, those other figures. And a scene that really uh, stands out for me is the role Muriel played when uh, Hubert Humphrey is literally at the convention in Philadelphia, maybe having some second thoughts about how strongly he wanted to present the civil rights case. And meanwhile, his wife is uh, sort of... Um, real estate shop, sort of house shopping. Well, they're looking a, it, for it, the typical summer yeah, vacation lake house. cottage on a lake in Minnesota. Exactly. And she discovers that there were uh, restrictions on Jews in this community where she was looking, and she communicates this to her husband. And uh, I think you suggest that it had some effect in, in stiffening his backbone in, in uh, this moment that's really the, the culmination of, of the book. So, um, But uh, what I really wanted to do was to... 
just offer kind of three quick observations. And I think inside each one of these observations is a question that you can choose to, uh, to, to take up or, or, or not as, as, as you wish. Um, the first observation, uh, I guess I would say this, is how similar in many ways Hubert Humphrey's story is to Lyndon Johnson's story. Here are two figures who grew up in impoverished communities, who really knew hardship, but I think also crucially knew both hardship and relative affluence and what it felt like to toggle between the two, right? There are moments in Humphrey's uh, early life where his family is doing pretty well, at least by the standards of their community, and the same thing could certainly be said of of Lyndon Johnson, and I think it, maybe it's these experiences not just with poverty, but with the vulnerability of people who might have thought they were doing well, but were still, you know, uh, uh, vulnerable in, in many ways, that makes a really lasting impression, and I think really convinces these two quintessential liberals that. You know, ordinary people need the helping hand of activist government, right? People struggle not because of their own failures, but, be, but uh, because of larger structural barriers. And government needs to play the role of uh, helping people to overcome those, those kinds of barriers. Another similarity between LBJ and Humphrey is, I think you made this point on our podcast, so it's not entirely original with me, I'm <laughs> quoting, quoting you in some ways, um, is that you know, LBJ had this experience in Catula where he went off and taught for a year famously with this Mexican-American uh, class, a very impoverished community, and the story goes, and I think there's something to it at least, that this really familiarized LBJ with what it meant to be non-white in Texas, what it meant to be poor, what it meant to have such limited opportunities. And Humphrey's parallel experience is this, this time in LSU. I think, I mean, obviously there's a lot of differences between those two experiences, but this is a moment where Humphrey sort of steps outside his community, sees what the world is like um, in, in faraway places, and, and um, it seems to learn some, some lasting lessons that he carries with him as he thinks about, um, about civil rights. But one of the differences, it seems to me, is that LBJ talked about how important Catula was so much across the rest of his life. Whereas, and I could be wrong about this, but it seems to me Humphrey didn't necessarily talk about that experience in the Jim Crow South as much and sort of refer back to it. And I wonder if there's... Um, any larger significance, if I'm right about that, if there's any larger um, significance uh, to that. Um, and maybe a, an opportunity was missed in some ways by Humphrey to um, reflect back on what had to have been a really profound um, experience for him. The second um, observation I wanted to, to offer um, is about the all-important year 1945, and I was delighted to hear you talk about the origins of the book and your, really, your fascination with that year. So, you know, the, the culmination of your book is, is 1948, There's so much drama in that year, you do such a great job of teasing that out, but to me, kind of the chronological epicenter of the book is 1945, and the question that really looms large with me is, how did this guy, already committed to the things that would propel him to prominence, get traction in, in Minneapolis in this period. And you do, you know, you, you, you are at great pains to sketch this social world that was full of racism, anti-Semitism, right, full of hostile forces for someone like Hubert Humphrey. Um, and I suspect one of your answers would be, well, it's that post-war moment when new things were becoming possible. But I, I wondered if you could sort of tease out a, a, a direct answer. I know there's a lot mm -hmm. in the book that sort of indirectly answers to that question, but what were the secrets to his ability actually to attract votes in such a problematic um, place and, and, um, and, and time? And then the third thing, um, just uh, others may want to, of course, um, Touch on this as well. Are you know an, an, another um, uh, uh, observation? I've, I guess um, that uh, is is hard not to make. I think about the book are the links between the early story you tell and the later Hubert Humphrey. Um, you know, you you do some at the beginning, and of course, then at the end of the book to sort of set the early Humphrey in in the larger trajectory. Of, of, his, of his life, and, and a lot of that is, is very helpful in connecting this story to the Humphrey that we know much, much better. Um, but um, I wanted to ask you a question about what are the character traits that carry through 
from the story that you tell in great, great detail and the Humphrey that we knew later on. One that kind of jumped out at me maybe has something to do with loyalty, right? He was, you see so much of that in the story you tell. And I think one of the standard critiques of Humphrey is that he was overly loyal, right, mm -hmm. to Lyndon Johnson mm -hmm. and to others who actually dragged him down in many ways in, in later years. So maybe there's something there by way of continuity. But I would also suggest that there's an important discontinuity, at least, at least in the way I tend to think about Hubert Humphrey. In the story you tell, he is a risk taker in so many different ways, not least when he's on that stage in Philadelphia. But later on, that seems to go away. Or maybe it doesn't go away. But he doesn't seem very inclined to take risks in 1968 or 1972. He allows himself to be, to be tarnished, kind of, as, as this establishment figure is kind of worn out and, and has sort of dusty, outmoded ideas. So um, I probably got on too long, but a few, a few, a few. Should I address uh, those now, or wait till everyone's well, done? Why don't, we wait, wait, why don't okay. we wait? till everyone's done? Maybe just to get more. You know, I'll be really quick. I know Jeremy has a, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> you have a whole, and a whole folder thing. full of comments. <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think one. Thank you for for the book, and and as somebody who's a you know a student of this period, I think um, the 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 greatest strength for me is um, um, really the con the contribution to you know, rethinking um, America's second reconstruction, especially the timeline. Because what we often do, and I've even called this period the, the heroic period of the civil rights movement, but we, we foreshorten 54 to 68, basically, right? And it makes sense because the cameras are there, Brown is there, um, Emmett Till, Little Rock, uh, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, sit-ins. Uh, the March on Washington, the, the, the fantastic year of 1963, and then all this great, terrific legislation. When, when, in fact, I would argue that when we think about America's Second Reconstruction, it's really starting uh, during the Great Depression, uh, the 1930s, and, and, and also the anti-colonial fervor. And you've got that in here, too. And in certain ways, I think, I think one of the things that the book is a great contribution to is um, a, a Hubert Humphrey Who's, who's really catalyzed by the broad consensus around democracy and freedom, e even amidst the racism that you show and the anti-Semitism that you show. Because in certain ways, we think of ourselves in a very polarized time, but as you show in the 1948 election, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's gonna be four candidates running too, right? So you think about the politics of polarization with, with Henry Wallace and, 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 and uh, Strom Thurmond and, and Dewey and, and Truman, but when we think about that, that World War II ferment and, you know, the anti-colonialism that's coming about because of what's happening in, you know, Mussolini and invasions of Ethiopia, and there's so much. And there's a point where even the NAACP, 43-44, is an internationalist organization and also, as scholars have shown, a mass organization. So Hubert is really coming out of, I think, globally and domestically that tradition. I think what you show really brilliantly and, and really by Philadelphia and, you know, the, the dark shade of the Confederacy into the bright sunshine of human rights. One of the things we're seeing, he's not yet senator, right? So part of it is that, you know, we're seeing the boldest, bravest mm -hmm. Hubert. He, he's, not, he's not institutionalized. And you show, you know, Muriel is a big part of this. Um, um, uh, the, you know, the, the gentleman, the African-American gentleman who's, who's, who's the, the editor of the newspaper. Cecil Newman. Cecil Newman is a huge part of it. Um, Shine. So there's, there's a group of people who, who's mentoring and he's, he's learning from um, and who are teaching him. Uh, but I think what's so important about the book is that it, it is a United States that's both familiar but, but, but unfamiliar to us, right? In terms of you show the, 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 the catalyzing effect of the Second World War and its aftermath. And, this is right on the cusp. I mean, the Truman Doctrine, Cold War, it's about to happen mm -hmm. right after this. It's right there. But Truman, even though, and you show by the end of the book, the, the, um, the, the, one of the last campaign speeches, but the first one that talks about civil rights in Harlem, right? right. And, and, and how, how powerful that is. There's still some room there for um, what we might have become, right? Yeah. You know, and this is, this is an America where we're so secular you're not really in need of Martin Luther King Jr. You're not in need of, of a safer, and King becomes this awesome figure. I'm not downing him, but sometimes we think, oh, he just sort of appears out of nowhere. And you mentioned some of the people, but it's like Claudia Jones, it's Ella Baker, it's Paul Robeson. There's this huge liberal labor 
left alliance that is multiracial in the 1930s mm -hmm. and the 1940s in ways our students have a hard time grappling onto, and we, we teach this, we, we know it, because it's in black and white film, right? It's not, they can't believe, this is not as diverse as the population I would have liked to have seen, but they can't believe when you see that mosaic of different people, and, and, and folks were, you know, queer, Jewish, <laughs> the, the whole thing, working together for a different conception of multiracial democracy. And what you show really brilliantly is Hubert Humphrey is at the center of this, right? So it's not, he's not, on the margins of this, and he's, he's really, Philadelphia is the coming out party, and really, you know, um, to fulfill these rights and all, all these, it's the coming out party for a specific kind of consensus that um, becomes foreshortened because of what, what occurs after. So it's a really heroic Hubert Humphrey, but again, it's also a testament to, we, we had an opportunity, and there were millions of people who were supporting this, for, for a different kind of America, a multiracial democracy in the 1940s that, you know, we weren't gonna be scarred by a kind of sort of vicious Cold War censorship, you know, Du Bois and Robeson, no more passports, you can't leave the country, right? And, and even, you know, you know, Eisenhower is saying great things, he's saying it, right? And by the, by the last speech, he's saying he's committed with this self-determination to do this, right? So it's really extraordinary, and I think it, it's great in terms of how, how it helps to reperiodize the immediate um, post-war period, you know? And that's all I'll say. That's great. So uh, I really enjoyed this book in many ways. I enjoyed it. We, we just had a, a podcast conversation about it, too. And I, I want to make a number of points that build on the really wonderful comments that Mark and, and Peniel have made and, and that I think culminate in some questions, maybe even a few slight criticisms, because <laughs> anything worth writing is worth criticizing, right? Um, uh, but they're criticisms out of, out of love and respect for what you've done here. Um, the, the book closes uh, near the very end, uh, where I think you, you do what we all do as historians, right? You reveal how you're writing in a particular time about another time, right? Uh, yeah. Or did I not put the microphone on? No, sorry. I'm not sure I want to be recorded. Um, <laughs> I'll just hold it like this. So, um, so on on uh, page 402, uh, Sam writes: uh, the national endeavor to achieve a full, inclusive democracy proceeds not with inexorable advancement, but through cycles of oppression, resistance, liberation, reformation, and retaliation. Some of which you've covered in the book. Some of which we've lived in. Yes. the last few years, right? Ground can be lost, but ground can also be gained inches at a time, and with tenacious effort it can be held. For all his flaws and failures, Hubert Humphrey had committed his life to the grinding work of trying. Th th this, is a, this is a Hubert Humphrey for 2024, mm -hmm. right? This is the man who grows up in South Dakota, lives through uh, the Depression, has to leave college because he can't afford to stay at the University of Minnesota, has to deal with a, a father who you described on our podcast so wonderfully as, you know, as, a, as a, an, an eccentric, an intellectual, but also a bit of a shyster <laughs> at the same time. Uh, he, he lives through all this, and he's able to find a guiding light. There's a bright light that he's able to, to, to manifest, as, as we all hope uh, we, can, we can find in our society today. Uh, it's so striking to me how different he looks from when, you know, more years than I want to reveal ago, I was working on my first book, Power and Protest, and I was reading about him at the LBJ Library, and um, he's vicious towards anti-Vietnam protesters in his meetings with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, at times, he encourages Lyndon Johnson to use more fo force on protesters. Um, you already referred to, and Peniel did as well, right, the Mississippi... Uh, uh, Freedom, efforts, Democratic free de Party. Free de yeah. Freedom Democratic Party, the efforts to seat them in 64, where, where Humphrey is one of Johnson's henchmen <laughs> in, in not uh, allowing them to be seated. The, the, the Humphrey of 20 to 30 years ago was still the Humphrey of the 1960s. You found the Humphrey of a much earlier period. And it, and it led me to think about a question I think we all struggle with as historians and biographers. I struggled with this when I was writing about Henry Kissinger and also focusing on his early life. To what extent does the early life tell us about the later mm -hmm. activities? Your, your book presumes that, and it's compelling that there is a, there's a, there's a, human, a human rights, as he calls it more often than not in the book, right? a human rights, a civil rights prophet in Humphrey. 
But I'm not sure he actually becomes that. Mm-hmm. I'm not mm-hmm. sure he actually becomes that. Is his early life different from his later life? Mm-hmm. What, what changes? And it did strike me throughout the book that one thing that's really interesting about the Humphrey that you describe is that he is a, he is a, he's passionate about what he's committed to, but because of the difficulties he's confronted, he's also pragmatic. He has to be pragmatic. And I wonder if that pragmatism actually becomes a limit to his prophecy. We like to think that pragmatism and prophecy can go together. And there are moments when we see that Lyndon Johnson is exhibit A, Franklin Roosevelt is exhibit B on that perhaps, right? But, but is, that, is that actually part of the problem? Is that what people have found icky about the Democratic Party for so long? <laughs> Uh, I'll reveal uh, our daughter, uh, Natalie, who's at the University of Wisconsin. She's a senior. She called us last night at 9 p.m., very angry, very upset, Uh, not about Palestine and Gaza. She's been upset about that in her own way. Uh, She was upset because of the execution of that gentleman in Mississippi yesterday. And she was upset. She was accusing me of not telling the Democratic Party, if they're going to listen to me, Mm -hmm. to condemn the death penalty. How is it that... Kamala Harris could shift positions on this as she had, saying she doesn't oppose the death penalty. And a gentleman who even prosecutors in Mississippi today say the evidence is tainted, can, can be prosecuted. I said to her, well, Kamala Harris has to get elected. <laughs> and she'd be a lot better on this issue for you than on the death penalty issue than the other side, to which Natalie's response is, and what I could imagine someone saying about Hubert Humphrey, that's exactly the problem with the Democratic Party, <laughs> that that pragmatism leads to the acceptance of more injustice. And I think there are a lot of young people who feel that way uh, today. Um, I, I, I would love to hear you respond to that, because I think you make a compelling case for Humphrey. This does not detract. And in some ways, this goes beyond the book. But I do think the book is intended in some way to for us to see him in a, in a prophetic light. I wonder if that is as prophetic as, as, as it sounds, or is, is there more prophecy in, the, um, you know, in, in someone like Fannie Lou Hamer, mm-hmm. who refuses to compromise time right. and again, right? Where, where, do we see, where do we see prophecy? What role does early life play in later life? Uh, I was also fascinated, as we talked about a little bit on the podcast, and as I think we have to talk about because our wonderful uh, Jewish Study Center is sponsoring this event on the relationship between African American and Jewish activists, African American and Jewish civil rights. Um, in 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 the book, um, there's there's clearly a way in which, as you say so well in the book, as you describe so well, World War II and the Holocaust is a motivating factor for the larger endeavor of of Hubert Humphrey's career. Um, but I I wonder um, I wonder where where he stands um, on some of the not explicit violence towards the Jewish community, but what is still a gentleman's anti-Semitism in American politics. Um, and, and this is not a criticism of the book at all. That's not what you were writing about. But that is the world that, that he's in, right? right? The Senate of 1946, 47, 48. It, it has all the qualities, all the qualities of this moment of political change, uh, as you describe beautifully, uh, to secure these rights, the report that's issued by the White House in 1947, which leads in some ways to the 48 Convention that you, I think, wonderfully describe in a, in a long, beautiful, meaty chapter in here. Um, but at the same time that that's happening, this is still a world of right, gentlemen's anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. This is still a world uh, where Jewish covenants are restricting people's access in all sorts of areas. Um, and and I don't know. I didn't I didn't get enough of of where where Humphrey is uh, on on that. I'm, I'm I'm asking you for more chapters, I guess. But <laughs> I'd love to hear. I, I already yeah. delivered a book twice. The contract to the length. <laughs> the the last point I wanted to make, Sam, is is I think what really one of the big contributions of this book, I think, for us as historians and and political thinkers, is uh, this is a book about liberalism. Right. I mean, uh, I, I could have retitled this book, I think, accurately, The Promise of Liberalism. Hubert Humphrey is a great liberal in the 1960s and 70s use of the term right, that we need to recapture as a positive term. Right. He's a great liberal because he believes institutions can make people's lives better. 
He's a great liberal because he believes in social mobility. He's a great liberal because he believes in education, right? I mean, he was getting a PhD. And right? wouldn't it be great to have people run for those offices, <laughs> <laughs> have those kinds of advanced degrees, right? Uh, all these things, right, uh, make him a liberal in ethos and tenor and policy. Um, and he achieves so much. Uh, I think the achievements of 48, moving Truman on the issue of civil rights and then getting Truman elected. Uh, and you describe the politics of that so well in the book and, and on the podcast. That, that's all, I think, wonderful. But I think there's also a limit to this liberalism, right? Um, I mean, it is, and it's, it's a fair criticism of my own work, too, right? It's, it is a world largely of men. It is a world still largely of, 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 of white men. A. Philip Randolph is in your book, other figures. But this, this, is, still, this is still a pretty bounded politics. Um, and that also limits the horizons uh, of this politics. And, and I wonder if, if the story of conservatism that you do cover very well, the reaction against this, the backlash, as you call it, right, is part of the story. But if there's also the loss of those who could be part of this coalition, who were part of this coalition by Frank, in Franklin Roosevelt's era because of Roosevelt's skills, because of the war, if the loss of that coalition, which to take it back to where I started, which is, is everything we're struggling with in our politics today, right? I wonder if that's part of the story here, too, that this is, I mean, I, I think it's Alan Brinkley wrote about this years ago, right? I mean, this is, this is liberalism and its, and its limitations mm -hmm. here. Uh, and and the, the, the point I want to close on with that is I wonder if, if Humphrey himself saw that. There's a way in which, in the end, you treat him in his last years where you start the book as, you know, he's, he's still soldiering on, he's sick. And he's, he's coming out and he's giving all these speeches. He's running for president again. He's, <laughs> he's doing all this. And, and um, I don't know. I mean, part of that is worthy. Part of that is, is deserving of respect. But I, I, I wonder also if, if there's a, um, a lost past in that, if there's a, almost something a little pathetic uh, in, it, in it as well. And how do we, how do we think our way out of that? What, what should the liberal, the post-Humphrey liberalism look like? Well, first of all, I'm just so honored by the close reading and, and the keen insights of all of you. I'm going to try to address everything. If I miss <laughs> something, please um, hold up a cue card or, or something to remind me. I'll start with two of the broadest issues. First, what are the lineaments or lack of them between the younger Humphrey I write about and the Humphrey of Vietnam and later years? And secondly, what, what about this sudden end of this kind of magical moment in American political life when the Cold War begins? So on the first one, a key thing to know about Humphrey that helps explain where he is on Vietnam, besides personal loyalty, he could be loyal to a fault. He was loyal to a fault to a domineering father, his father, wished that Hubert Humphrey would have just stayed subordinate to him, helped run the family drugstore, and been basically um, a low-level campaign worker for the fathers. Imagine political campaigns like for governor of South Dakota. That would not have happened in a million years. And I think that you don't have to engage in psychobiography to think that a powerful figure like LBJ could exert a similar hold and demand for loyalty and subordination on Hubert Humphrey, but I don't go along with the exculpatory, it's partly exculpatory and partly extra critical to say that Humphrey supported Vietnam only because of Lyndon Johnson. I don't think that's right. Humphrey was a cold warrior. That was a problem in his political makeup and it's a problem that is born out of the very peculiar statewide politics of Minnesota. And I don't want to go into, a, into an endlessly long dive down that particular rabbit hole. But Minnesota actually did have an attempt by Communist Party members and fellow travelers to take over the DFL, the Democrat Farmer Labor Party. It was not typical of many other acts of the Popular Front and the left liberal coalition around the country. That was a big mistake to assume that all of those examples were an attempt at a CP takeover, but it actually was the case in Minnesota, which has a lot to do with the quirk of a whole bunch of very radical Finnish miners in the Iron Range, plus some very left-wing uh, 
urban trade unionists in Minneapolis. No other state had that quirk. And Hubert Humphrey was part of bitter factional battles after World War II for control of the DFL between the CP and Popular Front and between anti-communist liberals like himself in which both sides were vicious. People purged their friends, people purged their allies, and Humphrey was called a fascist. Muriel was roughed up trying to get into a convention hall. And Humphrey overinterpreted from that. He applied that specific Minnesotan lesson nationally and ultimately internationally, which were two gigantic mistakes. Before he was a supporter of Vietnam, he was a supporter of the McCarran-Walter Act. Mm -hmm. He supported measures that Harry Truman vetoed as being too reactionary. So that part was always in Humphrey, and, it, and it's a big flaw. And I write about it a little bit in the epilogue of, of the book. But, and also, like Lyndon Johnson, Humphrey could hold two ideas about Vietnam in his head. We know that Lyndon Johnson is saying to Richard Russell, captured on the White House tapes, this is a mess. How do we get out of this? This can't end well. And Hubert Humphrey, in his first year as vice president, is part of writing a memo to Lyndon Johnson saying, this can't end well. We've got to get out. And Johnson freezes him out and punishes him. <laughs> and yet Johnson could also rationalize escalation, even while saying what he said to Richard Russell. And Humphrey could rationalize escalation, even after having written uh, this memo. So I think that's part of what explains it. And the, the ambition to do what you would need to do to get a nomination and <clears throat> to feel, because he'd been such a brave figure on civil rights, to feel that criticism of him, like during the anti-war movement, was personal and to react to it harshly because he took it as a personal rebuke, yeah. not as a yeah. political critique. And you were totally right about how outspoken, you know, and vitriolic he is in response to the protesters, very different from the politics of joy. The other thing, though, about the lineaments of Humphrey, and I didn't put this into the epilogue, maybe I should have, but Humphrey wages the last political battles of his life on a piece of legislation that's very true to the New Deal and the Great Society and the promises of this interracial, multiracial, interreligious coalition of leftists and liberals, which is a full employment bill, the Humphrey Hawkins bill. Mm -hmm. And that's his last battle. And it's anticipated to me by a speech he gives that I quote in the book on the eve of the Voting Rights Act being passed. And he's speaking to the Urban League Convention in Miami. And he's basically saying presciently, changing the laws will not solve the racial inequality problem. The economy itself must be fair. We're creating conditions in which there'll be a bifurcation in the black community between parts of it that can take advantage of the legal equality that's there and parts that because of economic inequality can't really make use of those laws. He saw that coming. That's why he was like Johnson in favor of affirmative action. And Humphrey Hawkins is a way to address that issue across racial lines late in his life. And unfortunately, Jimmy Carter in his <laughs> neoliberal way wants to water it down. Other Democrats in Congress want to order it down. Of course, the Republican Party is opposed to it. And so it's finally passed, but in this completely emasculated form. And so Humphrey, though, with Humphrey Hawkins, was being very true to his better selves. To um, Peniel's points about the Cold War, I could not agree more. And I don't want to say more about what I hope my next book will be, but it will be picking up almost from the point where this book leaves off, and it will be about what the Cold War did to destroy this moment of political coalition. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not here to defend Stalinism, mm -hmm. but the, the overbroad application mm -hmm. of opposing Stalinism was corrosive to the liberal and progressive movement of this time and stopped it in its tracks. Mm -hmm that there is an understanding coming out of World War II that the enemy of good politics in America is reactionary, reactionaryism, if that's a word, mm -hmm. and the remnants of pro-Nazi sentiment mm -hmm. in whatever form it takes. Mm -hmm. 
which rarely means explicitly being pro-Nazi, but parks that ideology under in, in other containers. And there was an awareness of that, and it was part of what allowed 1948 to happen. And I became very fascinated in this book and in a spin-off piece I later wrote for The Atlantic that had more than what I could fit in the book about the moment in popular journalism and popular culture that really educated American society about this. Everything from Gunnar Myrdal's An American Dilemma to these amazing books written by an Armenian immigrant writer named uh, Avedis Darunian, his uh, deliberately uh, waspy pen name was John Roy Carlson, who wrote two, two books about infiltrating the far right and the post-war pro-Nazi movement. And these books were bestsellers, even though no one knows them anymore today. And Gentleman's Agreement and Frank Sinatra's song and film The House I Live yeah. In. And, and all of this is giving moral instruction. A Superman series, Superman versus the Clan of the Fiery Cross, based mm -hmm. on you can mm -hmm. figure out what, uh, which is about a plot to assassinate a Chinese-American kid because he's a better Little League pitcher than the white kid on the team. And the white kid's uncle is a member of the Klan. These are mass journalism and mass entertainment entities, and they're instructing the society about how it's appropriate to be. And they're using language that's not saying being a bigot is bad. Beyond that, saying being a bigot is un-American. It's redefining what it means to an American. And once you get past 1948, and it's already building up before then, the curtain rings right down on it. Suddenly, you know, <coughs> worldwide communism is the enemy. Former Nazis are our friends, right? Werner von Braun and others. It, ends this progress in its tracks. It's one of the reasons Truman can't even attempt civil rights legislation. There won't be the votes for it, and why it remains unfulfilled until the early 1960s. I'll give you one more sense of how much changes. There's a book that no one knows anymore called In the Land of Jim Crow that comes out in 1948 by a Pittsburgh journalist named Ray Spriggle, who had done what um, I'm um, blanking the name of the writer who did Black Like Me, Griffin. What's his first name? John, yeah, John, John Griffin. John Howard. Okay, yeah, yeah, John, John Griffin Howard. in the early, in 59 or 60 dyes his skin and goes through the South passing his black and writes a book that becomes a bestseller about it. Ray Spriggle did the exact same thing, except he found out that the skin dye might be toxic. So it almost sounds hilarious. He goes to Florida for three weeks and tans himself to where he can pass the one drop rule and shaves his head. And he goes through with an NAACP com, uh, companion through the South for several months and writes a series for the Pittsburgh Courier, not the Courier, the black newspaper, but which syndicated it, by the way. The Courier carried his series, um, but for the Pittsburgh um, Press, maybe, or whatever the other Pittsburgh Daily was at that time, it becomes a book. It does not become a bestseller. It comes out probably literally six months, nine months, 12 months too late. Mm -hmm. Mass readership isn't interested in the story of America's flaws anymore. It's interested in reiteration of American innocence. And so that's, and it's only when we get towards 1960 and that innocence can be interrogated again that Black Like Me becomes a bestseller because people are ready to entertain the possibility of America's moral flaw because Dr. King and Malcolm X and still A. Philip Randolph and others mm -hmm. are showing the, the moral flaws and, and a lot of the public can't avoid facing them. So I'm completely with you on, on that point. Um, it also helps address one of the really good questions um, that, that Mark had, which is how in the city as bigoted as Minneapolis, because Hubert Humphrey have won a landslide election in 1945. And that has to do not just with 1945 in general, but actually the specific weeks and months. In Minneapolis, the mayoral races involve a primary and a runoff. These happen in May and June of a given year. Hubert Humphrey is running for mayor right as VE Day happens. He's running for mayor right as the newsreels that Dwight Eisenhower made sure American journalists shot of liberated death camps are being shown in the movie theaters of Minneapolis. 
right as the Minneapolis newspapers are publishing the New York Times reporters' um, firsthand accounts of the death camps. And for people in Minneapolis who'd always insisted they weren't bigots, even though they behaved in many <laughs> discriminatory ways, this is unavoidable evidence of what it, what the logical outcome, the logical extension of polite anti-Semitism is. You think it doesn't mean much to have a restrictive covenant at your lake resort or not to allow Jews to belong to AAA in, in Minneapolis, which is the case. Well, now you've seen where that goes when it runs amok. And that's a point Humphrey is making. And, what, and so you have also a lot of GIs coming back to their families, coming to the University of Minnesota on the GI Bill in their Quonset, living in the Quonset huts. And a lot of them are bringing back the sense of we fought this war for something more than defeating fascism abroad. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the home front is getting these lessons, these forms of moral instruction and moral shock. And that creates a persuadable share of the public that I think six months earlier or two years later might not have existed the same way. The other thing that happens that's very specific is while one part of Minneapolis, the larger share, is maybe rethinking polite anti-Semitism and what it means, and polite and, and racism and what it means, there are a series of vigilante attacks on Jewish teenagers and children in Minneapolis. It seems unconscionable. How can this happen right as we're seeing the newsreels of the death camps? But it's happening, and when the um, incumbent mayor, in typical fashion, basically says, this is just teenage hooliganism and, you know, Jews, stop your belly aching. Humphrey is the one who says Minneapolis has been told, warned repeatedly about its racism and anti-Semitism for decades, and it's never done anything about it, and it was inevitable it would become violent, and now it has. And I think that gives him a powerful selling point to voters. So he gets this sort of microclimate, if you will, in which he can reach people who otherwise might not have been reachable. Um, I'm trying to remember, oh, the comparison to LBJ. I think there absolutely are parallels of, they both had these families that were dropped down the economic elevator shaft. Humphrey's family was probably the best off family in Doland. He, they certainly lived in the nicest house in Doland. And to go from that to losing your home, to living in a, in a very threadbare rental, to seeing in a small town the banks close, seeing um, people come into Humphrey's father's drugstore unable to pay, and this is you know, the idealistic part of H.H., and he would take, the, you know, a chicken or some grain or whatever it would be. People would pay him what they could in commodities. He actually floated people in 1922 through 1929 about $14,000 of debt, which he knew he would never recover, mm -hmm. rather than see people totally go without. But eventually that causes the, causes the Humphreys drugstore to fail as well. So that experience, as with Johnson, and the Baton Rouge experience is a parallel to um, LBJ's year as a teacher in, in, in the Rio Grande Valley, gives the, him a very palpable tactile sense of inequality, both racial inequality and of economic vulnerability that will, that will stay with him. And I'm trying to remember, if I'm missing anything, please, please cue me here. Did our panelists want to respond in any way or, or uh, other questions that emerge? Well, what do you think in terms of from after investigating the young uh, Humphrey, what do you think sort of drives him for, you know, what, what happens to him? Because he really becomes a kind of tragic figure. And especially with when you see that person, he doesn't seem like the person who's going to... Um, go and speak to Fannie Lou Hamer and tell them to take two non-voting seats. <laughs> right. is, and, and even, you know, you know, one of A. Philip Randolph's protégés, Bayard Rustin, suggests they do the same thing. And Mendy Samstein and Jewish civil rights activists I've interviewed and stuff, they're, 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 they're uh, screaming at Bayard Rustin saying, you're a traitor. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Because even Rustin, who I completely admire, um, certainly the high point for him morally is the March on Washington. Then there's a real, a real dissent that people right. don't want to talk about. But I love that you talk about Jimmy Carter, too, and tell the truth, because, I mean, all this stuff, 
and we love Jimmy Carter and he's so great. I mean, an unbelievably flawed president. And, and the Humphrey Hawkins bill is just part of, you know, so many betrayals. Right, Miami deregulation. Yeah, and... yeah, just like what he, so he's great as an ex-president. I, I agree. <laughs> what I'm saying, it's kind of like, what, why, why the lies about his, yeah. and I know there's a whole center there, but it's like, tell the truth about what happened, just factually, mm -hmm. right? So w what do you think, like, why from 48 to 64? Because well, he seems like somebody who would have stood rock solid with the sharecroppers. Well, I think that it goes to one of the questions Jeremy had, which I realized I now didn't answer, which is what does it mean to be in partisan politics rather than to be an activist that Fannie Lou Hamer had the ability and the moral courage and the physical courage to be unstinting, to be uncompromising. So for much of his life today, Philip Randolph, when he wanted to have massive black draft resistance and people in Congress, including liberals like Wayne Morse, said, we're going to charge you with treason, he didn't bat an eyelash. He went ahead and like, go ahead, throw me in jail. He carries a, <laughs> a picket sign outside the convention saying that. And he was pushing the Democrats on civil rights, even though he was a socialist. He wasn't going to probably vote for Harry Truman, even with a civil rights plank <laughs> in the platform. So they had a freedom and a necessary role. You need those people to push the liberals to go as far as they can go. But I think if you're a liberal and if you're somewhere within the political establishment, it also does behoove you at a point to say, what can we get now? Do we hold out for everything we'd want or do we get some of the gains we can pocket now and try to build on them? That was LBJ with the Civil Rights Act not including voting rights. Mm -hmm. It looked like a betrayal, but a year later they got voting rights. And I think as, you know, as infuriating as it is at one level that Hubert Humphrey goes to the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and one of his closest allies in civil rights, Joe Rao, who was their lawyer, and says you're gonna get two seats, not the whole convention. The counter argument is that those two seats broke the back of having segregated delegations anymore at the Democratic Convention. In the wake of 64, the party rules forbade it. And in fact, just by seating two of the Mississippi Freedom Delegates, that caused the Jim Crow delegation to walk out anyway. So it had not the immediate effect, but within four years, the effect of ending segregated delegations. So that would be a liberal's argument, is that I know we didn't get what we wanted. I know you feel like I betrayed you, but we got something that we can ultimately build upon. And that's part, I think, of Humphrey's later life, with the exception of Vietnam. I think there's no defense to be made on Vietnam. I can explain it with this Cold Warrior history, but I don't defend it, it because I think it is an indefensible, an indefensible stance. But this is what people in, in elected office have to deal, have to deal mm -hmm. with, which is the question of what we can get at, versus what would be the purest position. The important interplay that Humphrey and, and Randolph, by the way, were both aware of in 1948, is if you don't have the activists on the outside insisting on everything, the liberals won't move far enough. The liberals don't know how far they can move until they're forced to move as far as they can move. So each needs the other. And actually this, I'm sorry, now I remember one more of Mark's questions about Humphrey talking about his time in the mm. South. I don't find much evidence of him talking about it in later speeches, which is interesting. He did talk about it at great length in the tapes he dictated for his autobiography, but most of it was edited out of the final manuscript. I mm. found most of it in the outtakes. Interesting. That's what got me started searching for, for it. Um, and also his whole experience of encountering the Black Road crew when he's a child is barely at all mentioned. It, he talked about it, but it basically got cut, cut out. And, but at points he would say a lot about it, or write a lot about it, when it was most present was the hate mail he got from around the country after his civil rights speech in the 48 convention. And it's not just from the South, a lot of it's from the North too. And there are a couple of constant themes in the hate mail. One is 
you obviously don't know anything about the South or you <laughs> would know why you can't have racial social equality. The other was you obviously don't have any black people in Minneapolis or you wouldn't be so naive about black people. Both of those were untrue. But there's this amazing letter I quote in the book where Humphrey, finally you can tell, you know, he has no more Fs left to give with the hate <laughs> mail at this point. And very uncharacteristically, you know, of Mr. Genial Hubert Humphrey, he writes back to this letter writer who's, you know, saying, would you want your child to, you know, have, have a black you know, spouse or words to that effect, or in any case, it's raising the specter of horrible miscegenation. And Humphrey says a couple of things. He says, number one, I lived in the South. I saw that system, and I saw how both poor blacks and poor whites suffered under the Jim Crow system. And number two, there's been racial mixing going on, and it's been happening because of basically rape. You know, he doesn't use the word rape, but he's not far off it. This is the rape by powerful whites of relatively powerless blacks. So if you're worried about racial mixing, that's what you ought to be thinking about. And it's way ahead of, it's like reading someone talking in our current rhetoric about bodily autonomy and about the violation of the black body. And, and what I love is at the end of this, I talk, Humphrey reverts to what we call Minnesota nice, which is not nice. Everyone's misusing this with Tim Walls. Minnesota nice is passive aggressive. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Minnesota nice is someone wearing the ugliest Christmas sweater you've ever seen, and someone going up and said, that sweater is very interesting. Um, so in Minnesota nice form, Humphrey ends this caustic reply by saying, perhaps I need to be better informed and you can, you know, you know tell me. So digging in the shiv at the end. So that was the most I saw Humphrey directly address it. And I'm not sure why he didn't make as much of it as Johnson later made it. But I don't know. Did, did, you can help me here. I knew from Caro and Nick Cotts and Robert Dalek about Johnson's time in South Texas. Was that something he talked about much when he was in active political life? I mean, it, it's, it's mentioned in two or three of his most prominent speeches, I suppose. Okay, then it definitely to, is. And Humphrey yeah. absolutely did not do the, the parallel thing. And I'm not sure why. But he also never talked about surviving an assassination attempt by a white supremacist, which also would have been a point of pride and, and to speak to the risk. And maybe that's just a part of as much as possible willfully trying to keep this genial veneer on a lot of things. Well, I just wanted to, I, I, I wanted to posit a, a, another explanation, which is that early on the the younger Humphrey is more pure in a certain way, right? Because he has less to lose. And the more he's in office, right. the, more and part, the, the more he has to lose. So there's a kind of conservatism or risk aversion that comes by the 1960s. Absolutely. He wants to be president. He's a weird mix because he's a late starter. Right. If Muriel <clears throat> hadn't urged him to break loose from his father, after Hubert had expressed these desires to be in public service, <clears throat> and if his sister Frances hadn't begun to introduce him to civil rights, Hubert Humphrey would have stayed a small-town druggist active in local South Dakota democratic politics. So here's this person who doesn't even end up with a bachelor's degree till the age of 28, who with, in less than a decade later is elected mayor of Minneapolis, less than three years after that is electrifying the country, and then is soon in the Senate, and the nearness to power, and this is a very Caro-esque theme, <laughs> the nearness to power, I think, gives him the desire to edit himself, to censor parts of himself, or to accommodate himself to high degrees of political compromise in order to keep moving up the ladder with the ultimate goal of the presidency. And it means that by the time we get to 1968, he's made himself the candidate of the machine, right. of the bosses. And I read a lot of his speeches from the 68 campaign. And what's really fascinating and tragic is that at the convention, he, you can see him edging towards wanting to really say, we've got to end the Vietnam War, we've got to go to peace talks right away, we've got to have you know, a bombing halt right away. And he can't bring himself to say it. 
is only four weeks later when he makes the speech that finally decisively parts ways with the policies that he had supported. And I think if he had had the guts in the convention yes. to speak, to say that... He would have won. He would have won. And also the other way in which he fails the moment at the convention and preceding it is the phrase the politics of joy comes from his announcement of his candidacy in April of 68. He's giving the speech weeks after Martin Luther King has been assassinated. He's giving the speech amid the Vietnam War, after, a few months after Tet. And for someone who usually had a great retail politician sense of where the pulse of the public was, he's completely off at this point. To talk about the politics of joy at that moment, just as utterly tone deaf. And even at the convention speech, he can't totally speak to the, you know, anxiety and ache and anger in the country. He addresses it a little bit, you know, starting with talking, I think it's either St. Jude or St. Aquinas, and this idea of things are so dire we need, you know, saintly intercession. So he's, part of him knows he needs to address it, but then he pulls away from it. Yeah. It's, worth, it's worth remembering, right, that Lyndon Johnson had not actually endorsed him. Well, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. unlike today, I mean, the big difference, right, is that I think it's in October that Lyndon Johnson Yeah, yeah the last him. minute. Right. And also, I don't think Lyndon, I mean, Mark, tell me, I mean, I, there are indications. I don't know if Lyndon wanted him to really win when we see him, like, sort of hanging out with Richard Nixon right after the election. I mean, it's, it seems like he's really conflicted me. There's a part of him that's humiliated this man and done all this stuff and finds him unfit to be president because he took the humiliation, mm -hmm. right? But, but, but the contradiction is that he said he wouldn't have a vice president who wouldn't take the humiliation, right? Exactly. right? <laughs> and so, but he now finds him unfit yeah. for the top job. So it's a real number that has to have been done on him psychologically there. No, I, again, I don't, I don't want to go too deep into psychologizing him, but again, thinking of Humphrey and his father, Humphrey and Johnson, the, you know, tender trap of ambition uh, and what you're willing to do to achieve something that you've spent decades yearning for, you roll all that together and you'll begin to go against some of your own values and some of your own best political instincts yeah. uh, as well. His reset comes a few weeks too late. And he does, I, I give <clears throat> him credit that he, he took the, the harsh lesson. I found this very poignant recollection that George McGovern gave in an oral history interview. He and Humphrey had been very close. Humphrey's sister, Frances, has helped manage George McGovern's first campaign for Congress. And then, of course, they part bitterly over Vietnam and their rivals in 72. But they ended up, when Humphrey went back to the Senate, in 1970 and thereafter living in the same neighborhood of a DC suburb, it's either Bethesda, I think it's Bethesda. And they would occasionally go for walks together in the morning by the time he got into 76, 77 towards the end of Humphrey's life and enough years after the 72 campaign. And McGovern recounts a walk at which Humphrey says, you know, George, everyone's saying that I only supported the Vietnam War because of loyalty to Lyndon. And I want you to know that wasn't the case. I know that it was the wrong decision now, but I did it because I thought it was right. I didn't just do it. He doesn't put it quite this way to suck up, you know, to placate Lyndon Johnson. And so it takes a, you know, a certain amount of integrity and honesty to own your worst mistake. To he didn't try to rationalize it anymore. He said it was wrong, period. That doesn't bring lives back, of course, and that's the limit to it, but it's better than the absence of it. So we have time for maybe one or two questions before we finish, and then I'll, uh, we just have to talk into the mic. So maybe, Bob, you want to start us off? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm old enough to bring us back in time a little bit. Uh, and um, I remember in 1968 when I was getting ready to go to the University of Wisconsin, uh, Bobby Kennedy was dead, um, Martin was dead, uh, and it was going to be Humphrey, and I had been a Gene McCarthy guy. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I'm having this discussion with my mother, 
And she just said, Hubert Humphrey is a really good man. So she had seen him back in 45, and this is a, a Jewish family. Yeah. I'm not even sure whether I learned the Lord's Prayer before the Shema, right? <laughs> I mean, it was a Jewish family in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and she knew that this guy had st stuck up for civil rights, had stuck up for Jews, uh, and she still respected him. So if you're looking at this thing uh, from the hindsight of this disaster um, in Vietnam and everything that, that broke, um, maybe broke his spirit and broke his chance to be president, I still think that there were a lot of people uh, that, that really admired him. I think that's very true, and I think he kept a huge <clears throat> share of the black American vote in 68. And something that I didn't know when I wrote the book, but is very poignant, is that when his um, coffin was brought back to D.C., he dies out in Minnesota, and his coffin's brought back to Lyons State in the Capitol, that spontaneously black people <clears throat> started lining up along the route of, uh, of the hearse or whatever car was bringing it because they remembered 48. It's not that many years later, so there are a lot of people who within a living memory knew about that speech. And um, that counted for a lot, and I think with Jewish people too, because they had to think, how many white Christians were really with us back then, would really put themselves on the line for us? And for some voters, that obviously really counted even over and against Vietnam. So did they take maybe one more question from Mark, I guess, or? Well, it's not like Richard Nixon was the peace candidate. Right. <laughs> when I was 16 years old, I encountered him, 1969, in the mayor's office of Detroit. I was a high school intern, and I saw the admiration on the part of many people, but I also saw a craven obsequious man who was out of touch and who could not communicate to people my age or mm -hmm. older. Uh, you know, so there's history and then there's the kind of personal experience one encounters yeah. well, when one the sees campaign these campaign people. Like a rat in heat. <laughs> and I think it's difficult uh, for later generations who did not encounter the history personally to quite understand the emotions that underlie this history too. Right. Well, one of the reasons I begin the book in 1977 is I felt like I have to take stock right at the beginning of this book with all the, you know, very justifiable reasons that many liberals were furious with Humphrey at that time. I had to lay out the bill of indictment against him first, because otherwise the book would look like it was, you know, deliberately avoiding the most damaging things that could be said about them. So, so I felt like, unfortunately, I had the speech he gave a commencement at Penn in 1977 that gave me a way both to sum up the bill of indictment but also because he's literally in the same building, the conventional, where he gave the civil rights speech in 48 to then hurdle back in time. Because if I didn't address that from the get-go, then that would be, I felt, a major flaw in the book and a major uh, argument to be made against its legitimacy. Well, let me just add two other points. Um, one is I do think that the scholarship has, in general, downplayed the role of the CP and socialists for really pushing the civil rights issues. And, you know, the story of Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey is so misleading yeah, because there the were lawsuits. The Daily there who there were it. lawsuits going on in the city that were going to force them. And that part has just been erased from the scholarship. The other is it's hard for me not to see Humphrey as a political animal, uh, purely a political animal who at various points said the right things, was a wonderful person, but in the end he was ultimately political. 
uh, you know, the 1945 provided an opening, but whether that was the consistent Hubert Humphrey, I need to be persuaded. So I have to read your book. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Mark, do you want to have the last word? Maybe the last question? Sure, an observation and then a question. You, uh, however, inadvertently, you've just made the greatest case for transnational history because Americans are said to not vote based on foreign policy, but you've all made the case that foreign policy has reverberates back to domestic policy by breaking or forging uh, interracial, uh, cross-religious uh, political movements is unbelievably powerful. We're always voting on foreign policy, even if we don't know it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jeremy, yeah, I, I wonder if the Gaza, Lebanon, BB wars have possibly affected the Democratic coalition. We'll have, right? Um, but what, what that brings, and Peniel, this is kind of t to your point, um, what it makes me wonder is what would, it, what would it take, what's lost, what's gained by the sort of the loss in general public memory of this pre-Cold War civil rights movement? And... Um, I mean, I guess an easy answer is, you know, why was Bayard Rustin obscured and then rediscovered? Okay, that's easy. Um, but what would it take for this, this movement to be rediscovered? And that's just kind of a closing uh, question for the panel. So, and, and then more directly, Sam, to, to your point, you know, why was this old Humphrey forgotten? I mean, why, why is this in the memory hole um, and how might it be recovered? I, I think because this is so much further back in time than his years as vice president and as presidential candidate, because... How many people are going to pay close attention to the life of a mayor mm -hmm. of a uh, mid-sized city or even realize that Minneapolis became kind of this amazing national petri dish for what you could do to make progress um, on human rights and civil rights because the view is, well, this was this overwhelmingly WASP city. What could, you know, race relations have been, as, how could race relations or you know, interreligious relations have been a big issue in a town where there are so few blacks and Jews to begin with. So there are a lot of reasons why, uh, you know, a great deal of attention wouldn't be turned back to that period of time. I, I get that. I don't think it's anything so reprehensible. There are a lot of logical reasons why the attention hasn't gone there. And frankly, selfishly, I'm glad people left, me, <laughs> left this opening for me. Well, please join me in thanking uh, Sam Friedman and our panelists for the wonderful discussion. Again, I'd like to extend the invitation to all here to join us tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in the Quadrangle Room in uh, the Student Union, Texas Union, uh, for uh, Sam's Gale Lecture tomorrow. Uh, and then also uh, tomorrow, before that, at 6 o'clock for a pre-lecture reception. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>